There were churches too, filled with the holiest of relics. Fragments of the true cross set in gold and blood red rubies. And great jeweled cups made for the emperor's own communion. And at the heart, at the very centre of this magic palace, Byzantium's throne room, the throne room of the Emperor of Christendom. As you approached the imperial throne of Byzantium, you'd have felt as naked as a man on Judgment Day, utterly defenceless. The man who sat on that chair didn't rule by the will of God, he was the will of God on earth. He was God's instrument. He was divine providence personified. Some Byzantines believed that the end of world history would come when that man on that throne took his crown off and laid it on the rock of Calvary. It's probably the most total form of government the world has ever seen. You don't have, for example, participatory government in this. Who can participate in the will of God? You can only bow before it. You can't have morality or loyalty. You can't have good kings or bad kings. Because who can know the workings of the will of this astonishing emperor? That is Byzantine politics. Byzantium ruled with cosmic certainty. It didn't dominate its neighbours with vast armies, but with images of God and government, with bars of gold and promises of princesses in marriage and alliance, all dressed up in the silk robes of Byzantium. The Byzantines operated a kind of cultural imperialism, and at the center of the show was Constantinople, the golden palace and its emperor, the rituals of its church and court. In the 10th century, diplomats and merchants, Easterners and